Hey guys, it's Drew from Drew Does Trucks. I am back again with part two of our camper inspection series. This time we're gonna focus on our wheels, our tires, our hubs, and our brakes. It is a beautiful September day as I film this, but unfortunately when I actually film the footage that this video is gonna be, it was right in the middle of Hurricane Irma's remnants, so it is rainy, so I apologize for the noise. But this is probably one of the most important steps of your camper inspection because where the rubber meets the road, this is where your family and your belongings uh, safety really, really comes into play. Um, so kind of talked about that in part one. If you haven't seen that, check it out here. Um, part one is just gonna be our general walk around. We're gonna slide underneath the camper and just check the things that are, are really easy and quick, but can also really ruin your trip if they go wrong. Now, step two, like I said, it's gonna be wheels, tires, hubs, brakes. Um, this has to be done like once annually and i'll tell you why um you know if you blow a tire like we did recently we got lucky we found out right away we do run a tire pressure monitor system um we were running some cheaper tires that came on this unit we've replaced those with hercules h901s but you can see that we sustained some pretty good damage to both the insulation and the underskirting here um we've seen people get a lot worse these are actually your fuel lines for your camper so if you shred one of these, you can be dropping gasoline down on your hot braking and hub components. Um, these are rubber lines, they're not steel, so they'll melt right through if they sustain heat. If you get a hub or a brake that overheats, you know, you could burn this away and actually set the camper on fire. That's where a lot of fires start on towed campers, is right here at the hubs. And, you know, your best case scenario is you're going to end up on the side of the road with a wheel and tire that are hanging loose or um, a flat tire, and no one wants that. So keeping your hubs, your brakes, your tires in good condition, it's gonna increase your fuel mileage, decrease the rolling resistance of your rig, so you're gonna tow better, um, you're gonna experience less sway, you don't have brakes sticking on each side. So follow along with me in the rain as I tear these apart, check them out, and I have a couple little issues that I end up repairing. Um, but if you're interested in the repair aspect of it i recently made a much more detailed video where i repaired a variety of really common trailer issues that i experienced on my flatbed trailer which gets a lot more miles on it than my camper does and it gets a lot more abuse so if you have questions about seeing milky grease or having to replace braking components and backing components or you just want to see how trailer brakes work like how the actual components operate i just did a video on that not too long ago and i will link to that right here and I'll also link to it in the description if when you do your inspection, you do find more issues. So enough of me talking. Let's get to the content and start tearing these things apart. When we're checking out our wheels and tires, the first thing we want to do is check out our tires. These are Hercules All Steel 225, 75, 15s. I've talked about these tires in the past. These particular ones are made in Thailand. Um, they're not made in China. These are a load range F, they're an all steel, load range 121. They're pretty much as heavy duty as you could get for a 15 inch wheel. And I swapped off the factory castle rocks after I had a flat tire. But anyway, we wanna come in and we wanna check our tread. Okay, so we're looking, we want nice thick tread, which we have. We want even wear across the tread with no scuffing or regular wear. You can check this with your eyes and you can run your hands over it to feel, make sure that you don't have any regular wear. You wanna make sure, um, you wanna check your tire pressure. Of course, I'm using the Time 8 um, TPMS system, which I have a, um, I have a second review of that coming up. I've had a couple issues with it, but hopefully they're getting taken care of here. And then before we move on to anything else, we want to check our DOT date codes on our tires. So. A lot of times, some tires will have them on both sides, um, but some tires will only have them on one side. So this is your, this is a DOT stamp, but this isn't what I'm talking about. So your tires will have a, um, they'll have a stamp on the sidewall, and that's how you can tell when your tires are made. A lot of times, it gets put on the inside. So let's take a look here. Okay, so right here, these ones are really simple. Your DUT code and you have 0920 stamped in here. So these were made in September of last year, so these tires are only one year old. 
um, as you can see that stamp doesn't exist on this side so if you don't see that stamp just check the inside a lot of times it gets flipped inside um, some tires will have it on both sides and a lot of tires don't anyway um, I recommend changing your tires at least every five years some people change every three it really just depends on what your failure rate is I think if you buy quality tires and you make sure they're inflated every single trip whether you're using a TPMS system where you're manually checking your tire pressure before you start and at every break you take I, th I think you can probably extend your life but ultimately that decision is going to be up to you um, the next thing that we're going to have to do after we check our tires we want to check our wheels these are steel wheels and steel wheels are relatively maintenance free if you do have aluminum wheels it's not unheard of for them to crack and they may crack um, th this way sometimes but a lot of times they'll crack if they're spoked they'll crack from the hubs out so you just want to check your your wheels if they're dirty this is a good chance just to clean them that way you can inspect them for any cracks like I said these are steel wheels steel wheels are relatively low maintenance and you're typically not going to have that many problems with them which is one of the reasons that I like having steel wheels on a camper the only benefits to aluminum wheels are that they are lighter and that they look nicer but um, you know you switch from steel to aluminum wheels you might drop uh, you know 50 pounds over the whole camper which it's not really a very big deal and it's it's uh, sprung it's called unsprung weight because it's below the springs so it doesn't really affect your payload capacity all right well the next thing we're going to do is we're going to have to jack this camper up and we're going to take these wheels and tires off so we can check out the condition of our hubs and our brakes so you will always hear probably one of the first things you'll hear when you get your camper is never jack a, a trailer axle up by the axle tube so if we look at this these this is not just a simple piece of pipe this is actually cambered um, and that allows it to have some flex as the trailer gets loaded it will rotate the top of the tire in um, so the concern is if I did if I put a jack right in the middle of this and lifted the whole camper off the ground this axle is rated at um, this particular axle is rated at five just over 5,000 pounds, I believe. It's basically a 6,000 pound axle tube. So you'll be supporting a 10 or 12,000 pound camper on a 6,000 pound axle tube all the way in the middle. So yes, you could bend it. That's gonna interfere with, uh, it's gonna, that's gonna change your, your camber if you do bend this axle. Now, let's move all the way over to this end. If we jack up one tire at a time, because we have these equalizers in the system and we have shackles on these equalizers, we can jack up one tire at a time um, right here this is our our u-bolt plate so we're transferring that force into this u-bolt plate this is where all of the all of the campers weight is resting right here so divided by four but every time you hit a bump that pushes this up you've got the entire weight of the trailer pushing down on, on basically one tire so it is okay to jack up right here to lift one tire now if you want to lift the entire side of the camper all of the weight that's pushing down this camper is pushing on three spots your front leaf spring hanger your rear leaf spring hanger which will look just the same as this here in the back and your equalizer here in the middle okay and this is very heavy duty cast iron so it is safe to lift right here because this is basically the point of your camper that is designed to take all of that weight all right, so we're gonna make sure that we have like a our jack directly under the equalizer, especially if we're using a block of wood like this. The other thing we wanna do is you always wanna make sure that the wheels we aren't lifting are securely chalked, which this is already chalked on that side. We'll go ahead and jack this up. I just want the wheels and tires off the ground for this, which they are. So once we get our wheels and tires off, we're gonna come and bring jack screws in to make this safe to work under. So I'm gonna jack it up just enough to slide this jack stand under that leaf spring in the front. I think that should be just enough. So you can see that it's securely supported 
this is not at risk of collapsing because it has that leaf spring underneath of it. We're gonna come around and do the same thing in the back. Get that in there nice and snug up against that spring. And there is really no reason to release that jack. We have this securely supported with the jack stands. We could relieve the pressure on the jack, but right now it is supporting the weight of that across these three, um, these three points, which is how it is when you're riding down the road. So this is as secure as it's gonna be. And the next step will be to take the wheels and tires off. All right, so when it comes to doing wheel and tire work, there's two things I recommend everybody buy. Now you certainly can use a four-way lug wrench. I'm sure we're all familiar with those. And if you don't have anything else, or even if you do, it's a great manual backup to carry one of those in your tow vehicle. It also lets you help other people on the road that might have different size lug nuts. But I actually carry uh, this, which is a Milwaukee half inch impact, which I've used in other videos. And it works very, very well. Um, if you don't want to spend the money on this, I think this is like $300. Um, this smaller Milwaukee, this one's actually only a quarter inch quick disconnect. This will actually remove lug nuts that are torqued to 100 foot pounds. Now, these Astali's hubcaps vary. There's actually a lot of them that you'll have to pull a plastic hubcap off before you can take the lug nuts off. If that's the case, you want to look around it and see if there's anywhere to stick a screwdriver or a pry bar in to pop it out. This particular style actually inserts in the wheel from behind. So it's not removable until the wheel is removed, but you can stick a screwdriver or um, a pry bar in behind this little plastic cap and pop that out, which I'll go ahead and show you before I take the wheel off. So you don't need anything special to pop these plastic caps out. Sometimes they'll have like a recessed area on them, which this one does. So I don't know how well it'll show up on the camera, but this is solid. And you'll see that this is a slot right here. And all you gotta do is stick, see how that slot represents a little gap in the prongs. And these are just like a, a friction fit and they pop out. So the advantage of popping that out is that in a pinch, you can remove this um, rubber dust seal on the end of these hubcaps. As you can see, as soon as we pull the wheel out, this whole thing gets loose. I'm gonna go ahead and stick this in because we don't do that right now and I don't wanna lose it, but it just clips back in place. There we go. All right, so this is what you're gonna see behind your wheel and tire. Hopefully everybody's more or less familiar with this. So you're gonna need a screwdriver or a pry bar. You're gonna come in behind this dust cap and you may need like a hammer or something to push this in or you may just be able to tap it in with your palm. It just depends on how they're installed. These ones are tight, so we're gonna use a hammer. So you can use a flathead screwdriver or a little pry bar. Sometimes a pry bar gives you a little better advantage. This one's beveled on the ends, so it'll slide under that dust cap just a little better. You'll see once it goes, it'll pop but don't pull it, go ahead and spin it 180 degrees and pop the other side. Then the thing should be pretty loose. If there's any one spot that's still a little tight, you can pop that in there. And then if you twist your pry bar or your screwdriver, you can force that cap out. And I advocate just taking it nice and slow. All right, so this is what you'll see once your cap pops off. This is your grease zerk. This is your cotter pin. And this is called a castle nut because there's little turrets on it like a castle. And we're gonna have to pull that off to check out what's behind them. All right, so when you pull your, your uh, dust cap or your hub cap off, this is what it should look like. You should see grease on it. If this is bone dry, that could indicate a problem. So everybody has their own way. They like to remove these. Needle nose pliers can help. And you can see this particular one as it goes at an angle. I'm not sure if the camera's gonna pick that up. It goes at an angle, as you can see the head is up here. So I like to grab a pair of pliers 
and these are not adjusted all the way in there we go got a pair of pliers and then these let the legs of your cotter pin just bend those down as much as you can and i like to use a pick to catch that head and then use like a small hammer this particular one's a dead blow to get that started and that'll drive your cotter pin right out now you're not prying on it with screwdrivers and trying to bend it with pliers it'll bend itself as it pulls out so once that is off it helps to have a nice big um, socket to pull that lug nut off but I know that not everyone does so I'm going to try and do this without having any special tools just to show you that you don't need that so you can just use a big pair of pliers back that nut off as you can see it, it's not torqued down it shouldn't be more than hand tight with a large pair of pliers and this is called like I said before this is called your castle nut and that is because it is shaped like the turret of a castle so that way that cotter pin has something to bite into and keep this from backing off you always want to make sure you keep your greasy stuff clean so whether you have a, a tool tray or an old Tupperware container or something you put that stuff in so once that is off you want to very very carefully remove your break drum hub assembly as you pull this out you're going to see this bearing pop off this is a little heavy so if you're not super strong get someone to help you okay so then once it once that pops push it back on and this is called your outer bearing because it is outside of the hub this particular one is very thoroughly coated with grease but this grease does look just a little bit old we'll talk more about that in a second now that the outer bearing is out of the way we're going to completely remove this um hub drum assembly okay so these are heavy this is cast iron so we're going to pull it out we want to make sure we support it underneath because there's a grease seal in there behind there there we go all right so with that off this is our braking system we can come down in here and look we can see our this is the the seal okay that we don't want to nick if it's in good shape unfortunately this should not look this way we should not have this is grease that is pushed past that seal so the seal is blown and all this grease has filled our braking system so we're not getting very good braking performance because as you can see our shoes are coated with grease and that's sort of wore off in some places so these would still be giving some braking performance but you know your your magnet um so everything in here as you can see it it moves freely the grease has done a great job keeping everything lubricated but um it's go all this is all going to need completely cleaned off with um brake parts cleaner and then this seal is going to need replaced before we can go ahead and put this back together and this this kind of stuff is typical and this is exactly the reason that we take these apart and inspect them hopefully every year so we would get back to this so these bearings have and this is see how this is greasy so that got that little piece of dirt on it you do not want dirt in your grease these are going to get cleaned and repacked <clears throat> but these move freely i don't see any signs of scoring or heat damage they don't have any tr any play left and right so we're going to reuse these bearings but we will clean and repack them and we're going to have to clean all of this with brake parts cleaner which i'll show you um, once I receive the new seal, which we'll try and get. Um, these seals can run anywhere from 10 to like $30, so they're not super expensive. And they do wear out. Um, if this seal is going to ride here, and as it spins, you know, it's, it's a rubber seal usually with a metal spring inside of it, so they do wear out. And if you get someone who's gung-ho on pushing their zerk, their grease in through this zerk, that grease is going to come in it's going to fill these bearings um, and then it once this cavity is completely filled it'll build pressure inside of them so especially on a hot day or if you're using your brakes a lot that pressure cause inside the hub is going to expand and it has to go somewhere so it's going to burp past the seal and once it starts to burp past the seal the seal's integrity is pretty much compromised so there's a chance you could clean all this up and be really careful about reapplying your grease and put it all back together without changing the seal but just to err on the side of caution we're going to change the seal um, having working brakes is important 
So once we get these cleaned up, I'll show you some other things to check out. For now, I'm gonna go ahead and get those grease seals going. It looks like it's gonna rain. Um, so I don't know if we'll get this finished today, but we will get the parts we need and we will follow through on showing you guys exactly what else you wanna look for when you're tearing apart these wheels and axles for your annual inspection. All right, guys, we're back again. Um, it is just pouring down rain. I guess this is the remnants of a hurricane that just struck the Gulf of Mexico. So a lot of people are a lot worse than we are up here in West Virginia. So we, uh, I, I cross-matched the part number on our seals. We got these seals from Napa. Um, these are not identical to the ones that are on there. These are very, very close, and they're probably a much higher quality than the ones that are on there. These have more metal, and the rubber part is very hard and very thin, so they should resist blowing out a lot better than the ones that were on there. Um, I also got lots and lots of um, brake parts cleaner. I have to use that to clean off those old shoes. And then, um, I, I've been looking for my seal puller. I can't find it, but... This was $8 at Napa. Um, this is an Evercraft seal puller. So if you find yourself having to do one of these jobs, you're gonna wanna grab one of these. You can definitely pop these out with a pry bar, which is what I did on my last video for the flatbed trailer. But the profile of the seal puller makes it really easy to pop these out with less damage. So what I'm gonna do is, before I start working on anything, I'm gonna put my rubber gloves on because grease is really nasty. We're gonna clean everything up which I think for these, I'm gonna spray with some degreaser and hose them off first, because they have so much grease on them. Then we're gonna use our brake parts cleaner to follow up with that. As you can hear, this rain is really intensifying, so it's gonna be really miserable, but I'm gonna try and go ahead and finish up this side today. All right, so after hitting these with that degreaser, I went ahead and sprayed purple power on it, let them soak, and just that alone, you can see these are like brand new. So we're gonna hose them off, um, we've cleaned up the drums a lot too. They still need just a little bit of uh, cleaning right here. So we're going to get those cleaned up and then we'll replace our seals and we'll reassemble this. So my first step dealing with the uh, hub and axle assemblies is almost always going to be putting on a set of nitro gloves. Everything's greasy and dirty. So while we're working on these seals, we're gonna be letting all these components air dry. We're gonna go ahead and get everything a good cleaning with some brake parts cleaner before we reassemble. Now the seals themselves, they come out pretty easily. With a seal puller like this one, all you have to do is insert it under the seal. It has two different jaws for different size seals. And with a rocking motion, you can pop those seals up out. Just like that. And these are a double lip seal. Our replacements are a single lip seal. Although the part number is the same. And I'll show you the difference in the style seal. I don't know how well this will show up on camera. So these old seals have a spring inside of them that's what maintains tension on the seal and when, we, when i show you the new ones you'll see that they don't have that that they're a pressed one piece seal they're supposed to be a higher quality seal so the one thing you always want to take advantage of, anytime you have your seals out these are your inner bearings again inside the hub and these are your larger bearings that carry the majority of the weight of the trailer these bearings are nice and tight. And once again, our, our grease in here, we're gonna try and repack these before we insert them. And now is the time to do that. We're gonna take a clean rag. We're gonna try and get as much of this grease out of this hub as possible. This is just old grease. There's nothing wrong with it. It just needs changed every few years. So um, it's always good to have something nearby to put these rags in. 
because there's going to be a lot of grease that has to get out of here. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap these bearings in a nice clean cloth and set them to the side so they don't get filled with junk. We're going to pull a couple more shop rags out. We'll get all the grease that we can cleaned out of this. It's not essential that they be cleaned perfectly, but the more grease you get out, the easier it is to get fresh grease in without it being diluted by this old grease. So what I like to do once we get the majority of grease out like this, is give our give our hub and especially our steel seating surface a blast with some brake parts cleaner. Um, in particular, the area where the seal is going to seat. We'll give a quick blast with the, the little straw. This is why I always recommend um, wearing your nitrile gloves because to repack these bearings, you want to get about a palm full of good grease. This is nice, tacky, high temperature, red, all purpose grease. And we're going to rotate the, see how I'm rotating this bearing? as I roll it through my hand. And what's that doing is, is hitting it in my palm, is forcing that grease up into those bearings and rotating it while I do it, is pushing it up in and around those rollers. So as I do this, you start to see some of the old grease get pushed out. And I don't, I'm not too obsessive over this. But I'll go ahead and do this for a couple minutes. And we're seeing that old black grease get pushed out. You see it here on the tip of my finger. And what it's doing is just being replaced by this high temp red grease. And if you're not completely changing the bearings, that's about the best you can hope for. All right, so this bearing is completely packed full of grease. We haven't completely replaced the old grease, but we have um, replaced a lot of it. And you can see where the black grease has come out in this hand here. And as we see globs of that, we'll go ahead and just wipe them on our towel, pick up fresh grease, and we'll repeat that process. This is a messy job, but it's, it's an easy job. There's no skill involved in this. Alright, so once we're um, confident that we have got that bearing well greased, we will place it back in the race. And then uh, the easiest way to dispose of the grease that's on your gloves is simply to grab the top of one glove, put your finger under it, which is hard when they're all greasy. Come on, there we go. Take off one glove, hold it in your palm. Grab the collar of the other glove and turn it completely inside out. You may get a little grease on the outside, but for the most part, it's going to keep your hands completely clean. And just put on your set of gloves. All right. So before we'll go ahead and put the seal in, I want to take uh, the corner of a rag here. I just try and clean out my seal seating area. Um, it's it's going to get grease on it. It's almost inevitable, but we really want it as clean as possible when we drive our seals on. So we can see that our new seals we do not have this huge rubber lip. So this seal here is very firm. This old seal, uh, again, some of us didn't pick up by the camera. I can actually push this in with my finger. So yes, it does have this double layer of wipe, but this new one is just built to much closer tolerances. It's going to be much harder for the grease to force its way past this rigid seal, which as you can see is just hard nitrile rubber as compared to that soft rubber with the spring in it on this one. See how easily this deflects with my thumb and this doesn't. So. <clears throat> And when you install your seal, these are pretty easy to mess up. So right here I've got a little nick in this, which I'm not sure if that's going to affect me or not. It shouldn't. Now, for the record, I have driven 
lots and lots of these seals in using a big um, socket and a hammer. But I did just pick up this kit right here from um, Harbor Freight and it was very inexpensive. And this kit has a variety of different diameter plastic bushings we can use to drive those seals in. So I thought I would try that. So the one thing we should never have to do with seals is to really whack them in there. We should be using nice, soft, gentle blows to make sure everything's lined up. We're gonna pull that away and we can see that we've got all sides seated evenly. We're just slowly driving it in. This side's seated, this side isn't. We're driving from the middle so we know that's applying equal pressure across the range. And just a little bit further on this side and that seal's gonna be completely seated. That's it. We give it a couple extra hammer blows just to verify that we're not making any further progress on this. And actually, I think we probably could do just another blow on this side, just a little bit raised up. There we go. So I move in that extra little bit. Here we can see this is completely completely seated in. We still have a little bit of residual water here. We dump that old grease seal out of here and use this rag. Let's go ahead and set that up. And you can see they're much cleaner now. Alright. I'm going to clean all these off with a final blast of brake parts cleaner. Make sure our shoes are nice and clean. The rest of this we're not quite as worried about, but the, the shoes have to be clean for the brakes to work effectively. So this brake parts cleaner, it evaporates very quickly. We'll give that a second just to evaporate, and we're going to reinstall our hub drum assembly. As you see, you see how fragile these grease seals are. So that's why we have to support it carefully as we slide it on. Once we get it on, we'll repack our outer bearing, and then we'll reinstall the same way we took it off. Again, we're going to take grease, we're just going to work it down through. All right, we're just going to clean up the outside of our hub here. And then we'll be ready to clean and reinstall our thrust washer and our castle nut. Any contaminants that are left on the thrust washer can carry into the grease which is the only reason that we give it a nice cleaning. And the castle mat, we just clean the grease out enough that we'll be able to see where to insert our new powder pin. I always like to take note of where a cotter pin enters and exits the end of the threaded portion of the spindle. We're not quite ready to tighten that yet and put the cotter pin in because what we need to do is we'll take our <clears throat> adjustable pliers that we used to pull that off and more or less we want that about hand tight. I like to tighten it until this hub begins gets hard to turn. So you see it getting harder and harder to turn here. So once that gets hard to turn, let me back this off, and I just back it off one castle nut position. And this is something that you can take a trip and you can reassess whether or not that's loose. All you need to do is shake your tire. If it's loose, that means this needs tightened up. I always replace castle nuts. 
I consider them a one-time use type thing. You buy yourself one of these sets that have lots and lots of them in there, then you don't have to worry about it. We will bend our new cotton pin. Oh. And that's it. Um, we'll re-grease. I like to grease with this. We, we pump the grease in our bearings so it's going to fill up the inside. Now, as much as I really want a fancy electric grease gun, I haven't got one yet. I'm still using this old manual one. Which is fine because it lets you feel the resistance as you squeeze the trigger. Which is something the newer automatic ones don't do. So normally you'll grease these until you start to see the grease get pushed out at the hub. And I like to go ahead and spin it to try and move some of that new grease around inside the hub. Okay, so I'm starting to meet resistance, which probably indicates that the hub is full. You do not have to go crazy. You pack your bearings. Like for years, before this came around, that's all you did was pack your bearings and stick them in. You might wipe a little extra grease over them for protection. But this whole um, zerk fitting on the hub is a relatively new thing. Trailers lasted a long time before we had this. So as soon as you start to meet fuel resistance, stop. We're gonna go ahead and clean up the grease that's left inside our little hub caps here. I'm gonna line that up. And if these are previously installed caps, they should go in pretty easy. If you have to replace a cap for some reason, the new ones can be tricky to get started. Always use like a soft mallet, like a dead blow or a rubber mallet, and always go all the way around 360 until you see them stop moving. You really want to make sure those are seated. If you have the dome style, you can use like a pry bar or a screwdriver right here on the flange and hammer to that. Just go gentle. These are thin metal. So here we go. We have, hopefully these brakes are going to work a lot better now that they're not coated in grease. I'm going to go ahead and finish up the second one the same way I just did this one. We'll put our tire back on and I'll torque it to spec, which I'll show you in a second. But this is how we do... This is how we do our inspections, and this is a common problem you're going to find and how easy and quick and cheap it is to replace that little grease seal. Hey, if you have more questions or you want to see more examples of how to fix different problems you might see with hubs, bearings, and brakes on a trailer, please see my other video up here. It has me rebuilding some components on my flatbed trailer which is very similar to most eight lug camper trailers and i pretty much experience every type of failure you could imagine from water in the grease to failed bearings to damaged grease seals so if you're interested in that or you're having problems with your trailer check that out for help fixing it all right guys i got both hubs done they both look good they both seem like they're working good and now i want to talk to you about um, how we put our wheels back on now as I mentioned, this is a 2017 Wolfpack 25 Pack 12. All campers are different. The one thing that all campers have in common is they're gonna have this placard right here. And this is gonna show you your tire pressure. It's also gonna show you your max weights. And in many cases, it'll also show you your wheel torque. And if it's not here, it may be closer to your wheels. But we wanna go ahead and see our factory size. These are 225-75Ds. And our minimum inflation pressures are 65 psi for that tire now as i mentioned at the beginning of the video um, or at least the beginning of this tire inspection i'm running a load range f tire so those aren't going to apply but if we come back here if you were running a factory tire you want to make sure your inflation pressure was set to 65 cold because cold doesn't mean 32 degrees fahrenheit cold means before you hit the road because your tires are going to gain pressure as you drive. 
um, the flexion of the tire sidewall creates friction which creates heat the heat increases the pressure inside the tire it's just simple high school level science but it seems like it's hard for a lot of people to kind of grasp how those two go together these are load range f um, i run these at the max psi that's stamped on the inside of the wheel which for these wheels is 85 i want to say um and that's what my tps is set for now what we do have we come back here we have check wheel nuts prior to each trip great advice this one says 100 foot pounds some of you guys with really heavy duty campers eight lug axles maybe 17 and a half inch tires or 16 inch tires those are typically going to be torqued to about 150. And the most important thing if you have steel wheels you can torque these and kind of forget about them it's always a good idea to recheck them if you have aluminum wheels and you torque them right now you have to go back and torque them after a heat cycle like they always say 50 this says if removing a wheel use torque wrench tighten at 50 tighten at 100 tighten at 200. the reason is this is steel these studs are steel but your aluminum wheel is obviously aluminum so those all expand and contract at different rates so after 50 miles you need to retorque because that aluminum contracting and expanding can actually cause that lug nut to back off slightly or to loosen slightly as you go down the road all all in this case six all six of those lug nuts would be experiencing that same um tightening and loosening of the expansion and contraction so you may have one start to back off what that does that places additional load on the ones near it just like expansion and contraction can cause a lug nut to back off that's going to start to cause a wobble which can also make those other lug nuts back off the next thing you have two that are side by side that back off then you have three at some point in time because you have basically the full rated load of this axle on this axle at all times because they don't really give you any extra with these scampers i think we all know that um what you're going to do is crack a lug st uh, a stud one of the ones that's remaining is going to break and once that happens it's off to the races because all the pressure of maintaining that tire on this hub is left to just a handful of studs with lug nuts on them so you'll lose the entire wheel and tire assembly and that can actually kill somebody because they're very bouncy to bounce through somebody's windshield so we want to lift our, our wheel nut a wheel up, up on our studs and i like to go ahead and apply all six or if you have five or eight or whatever and apply all your lug nuts by hand and get them threaded on and then what i'll do is i'll take you know this this milwaukee gun here is capable of about 1400 foot pounds that's way too much so i turn it down to its lowest setting and we'll just run our lug nuts in our jack a couple pumps we're going to get our jack stands out We're going to put our tire shocks back in. May need to go up just a scooch to get her back. Our jack stands clear of the vehicle. Yeah, from beneath it. We're gonna gently lower the camper. So as you can see, camper's back on the ground. And this wood block deforms slightly whereas underneath the equalizer, we have no damage to the camper whatsoever. Now, this is a torque wrench. This one's from Harbor Freight. I think it costs twenty dollars. This torque wrench seems like it's been broken somehow. I think it works in reverse. Mm. Worked fine last time I used it. It's that Harbor Freight quality for you. All right. So the good news is that I'm always prepared. I have this small electronic unit um, that we can use instead of that. So normally you'll go in a cross hatch pattern. I got a little distracted by not using this. 
uh, by not using the torque wrench I was anticipating using. So I like to go back and forth. So we start with one, we'll go to this one on a six lug pattern, then we can go to this one or this one. Since we've already torqued that, we'll pretend we have it. And then once we finish our torque pattern, it's a good idea to go back to our first one to make sure it hasn't loosened. That's especially important on aluminum wheels. And that's it. So the next trip we take, we'll recheck these about 50 miles into the trip. Make sure we'll torque to 100 foot-pounds. And we're all done with our camper inspection so I'm gonna go ahead and get in out of the rain if you feel like this video helped you out please click like um, share it with your RV friends if you think it's something that might help them and if you like videos like this don't hesitate to click subscribe I post a lot of other stuff but I do have a lot of camper content including some other videos I'm working on uploading right now a generator install um, repairing damage to skirting caused by a flat tire um, have content about roof inspections roof repairs so thank you guys so much i appreciate your time and i'm gonna go get out of the hurricane but i'll see you guys on the next video